Hi, good evening. Welcome to the 298th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. This is a weekly lecture series on comics, illustration, animation, and other work using text and image. It's sponsored in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. Our guest tonight is Marlene Villalobos Hennessy. Uh, Marlene is an associate professor, uh, professor in the Department of English at Hunter College of the City University of New York, where she teaches classes on medieval literature and the history of the book. She's published numerous articles on late medieval British manuscripts and religious culture and is the editor, the editor of English Medieval Manuscripts, Readers, Makers, and Illuminators from 2009. She has a forthcoming reference work entitled An Index to Images in English and Scottish Manuscripts from the Time of Chaucer to Henry VIII. And that's in uh, the, I guess, all in the National Library of Scotland. And she's also working on a book length project uh, entitled Blood Writing Manuscripts and Metaphors in the Late Middle Ages. Uh, this is, I think, your second talk for this group. I think you were here seven years ago, something like that. But this period has a lot to. Uh, tell us about text and image work and uh, things that have just lost, uh, been forgotten, or uses of text and image that people are not thinking about. So welcome uh, Marlene on her talk is entitled Book Miracles in the Middle Ages. So take it away. Well, thank you so much, Ben. It's such a great opportunity to speak in this really unique symposium. I'm delighted to be back a second time. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and um, and I'm going to just have my PowerPoint uh, going there and I'll just move this over there to the side. Uh, medieval saints' lives abound in which books prove indestructible and remarkably immune to the ravages of the natural world. In such narratives, books are often swept overboard at sea, only to survive unscathed. Legend relates that St. Margaret of Scotland's beloved gospel book, shown here, was accident accidentally dropped into a river, but when it was recovered, it was found mostly unharmed. The 11th century illumination and burnished gold still crisp all these centuries later. Other losses in water are recounted. Saint Coemgen Psalter, for example, falls into the water while he converses with an angel, but it is returned to him by a friendly otter. No letter nor lesson was the worse for the water or gnawing which it got. Saint Ciaran's gospel book plunges to the bottom of a lake yet it is dragged ashore by a waiting cow, bright white, dry, without destruction of letter. Books were rescued from other potential disasters. A plundering raven steals freshly written leaves of parchment from a companion of St. Guthlac. Yet through the saint's prayers, they're found hung up on a reed in the marshy fens, as though they had been placed there by a human hand. St. Aelred of Riveau reads outdoors in heavy weather and still finds his psalter impervious to the rain. A manuscript falls from the hands of a sleepy St. Majolus of Cluny, but when a burning candle sets the room ablaze, both reader and book remain impermeable to the flames. Medieval monastic writers often describe miracles as events against nature, and the manuscripts in these accounts were invested with the power to defy the general or familiar laws of nature. And while many of these book miracles drew upon a host of richly symbolic, long-standing medieval ideas and philosophical discourses about books, sorry, theological discourses about books, as well as the power of sanctity, 
in several stories and anecdotes about the life of St. Dominic, sorry, oh, there we go, shown here, manuscripts undergo an astonishing miracle of material transformation. These exceptional books, which are the subjects of this talk, radically upend nature to become endowed with human qualities and indwelling personality. The most infamous enduring medieval book miracle of this type appears in the brief Vita or Life of Dominic, known as the Libellus, the little book on the beginnings of the order of preachers. The earliest biography and the first narrative history of the foundation of the Dominican order, composed around a dozen years after the saint's death by Jordan of Saxony, one of his principal companions and his successor as master general of the order. Still early in Dominic's career and before the order was formally established, from 1206 to 1207, he was part of a preaching mission in the Midi in Southern France with Diego de Acebo, Bishop of Osma, the purpose of which was to win over alleged Cathars, Waldensians, and other critics of the church, and thereby combat burgeoning heresy. During this time, he was said to have participated in widely attended free and open public disputations with his opponents in several towns and cities in the region. One noteworthy vignette in the Libellus describes a debate between Dominic and some Cathars at Fanjou where both sides were asked to produce manuscript books that contained the doctrine and authorities of their respective faiths. The narrative relates that three local judges were chosen by mutual assent to adjudicate whose beliefs were more persuasive, but they were deadlocked and unable to come to a decision. A publicly staged trial by fire ordeal was proposed in which the two opposing books would be cast into a fire. The one that did not burn would be presumed to contain the paramount faith. The medieval ordeal usually involved human subjects, but this ordeal cunningly pitted two dueling books against each other. The text states, the heretical book was immediately consumed by the fire, but the one written by the man of God, Dominic, not only escaped burning, but in the sight of all leaped far from the fire. For a second and a third time, it was cast into the fire, but each time it leaped back and thereby openly testified to the truth of its doctrine and the holiness of the person who had written it. The narrative expresses an idea that the historian Robert Bartlett has shown is implicit in the ordeal, the belief widely held by many medieval people that God intervenes in the world to dispense justice. The Cathar manuscript burned vigorously while Dominic's book bounded from the flames three times in a row, each time emerging whole and intact and in violet integrity meant to proclaim not, not only the superiority of his Orthodox faith, but also the wonder working sanctity of his book. The codex, which the text says was compiled by him and written in his own hand, can be considered both a potent associative relic, relic and an incorruptible stand-in for his saintly body. The story enshrined in the libellus proved highly durable and was widely disseminated and actively promoted by the order, making its way into a host of Dominic's vitae, saints lives, with tenacious new offshoots in collections of exempla, which were short, edifying tales incorporated into uh, sermons by preachers to illustrate a point of do a doctrine. As an exemplum, this narrative was also used for the teaching and moral instruction of novices, religious, and lay people, thereby achieving a wide heterogeneous audience. The continuous diffusion of this particular version of the book miracle allowed it to play a starring role in Dominican history and legend and moreover, in fashioning the public corporate identity of the order. Dominic's book miracle subsequently became an enduring subject for representation in his iconography, and other bookish wonders continued to accrue to his legend. Like many saints before him, he was reported to have lost some books while crossing a river, 
but they were recovered a few days later by some fishermen as dry and unharmed as if they had been safely stowed in a cupboard. Even the letters for his canonization improbably survived shipwreck. The manuscript book became one of his attributes, and this was tied to yet another heavenly intervention. According to his hagiographers, in a dream, St. Peter gifted him a staff and St. Paul a book, objects that would come to symbolize the Dominican vocation. Most early iconography, like this Italian painted panel, which is the oldest known portrayal of Dominic, shows the saint holding a book, which became a fitting symbol. Books were not only essential to the life of prayer and contemplation espoused by Dominic and the order he founded, but were also crucial to the mendicant mission of preaching against heresy and affirming orthodox doctrine through textual exposition and disputation as he had done in the Midi in France. The order of preachers founded by Dominic proved to be both book dependent and book generative. Following his example, learning and erudition became hallmarks of the order, which became known for its intellectual virtuosity. Books came to take on an especial significance as many of its members were rigorously educated in philosophy and theology, which led in some cases to distinctive contributions in the production of manuscripts which were essential for preaching and teaching, such as critical editions of the Bible, biblical concordances, theological textbooks, manuals for confessors, and collections of model sermons. Humbert of Romans, who was master general of the order and who wrote yet another Vita of Dominic, describes books as, quote, a pipeline bringing wisdom down from heaven a sentiment that demonstrates that manuscript books continue to be portrayed as conduits to the divine in early Dominican writings. Thus, book production was believed to participate in the same heavenly networks of communication that had gifted St. Paul's book or had brought about the miracle at Fanjou. Echoes of Dominic's bookish wonder reverberated in other accounts that depict his interaction with books. For example, a text known as the Nine Ways of Prayer of St. Dominic, written by an anonymous friar from Bologna several decades after the saint's death, <clears throat> was later illustrated in this 15th century manuscript now in the Vatican Library. The Nine Ways comprise a range of intentional bodily postures of prayer that were thought to open a pathway to the divine such as the extending the arms like a cross, as in the color image at left. The art historian William Hood notes that the text rests on the notion that specific states of mystical consciousness can be stimulated by deliberately assuming bodily postures, end quote. In the text, the saint is described as practicing a prayer ritual in which his body was positioned to imitate a codex as in the smaller image at right, which I hope you can see. Whoops, let me go back right here. <clears throat> the text reads, quote, often his hands would be extended before his breast like an open book, end quote. This way of prayer is almost like a form of mime in which the saint is reading without books as there are no actual books in front of him. Instead, through his bodily deportment, he becomes the book. In doing so, his gestures also draw attention to intrinsically somatic connections between the human hand and the copying of books, an association that's embedded in the Latin roots of our word manuscript, meaning handwritten. The text also describes other bodily postures such as standing, kneeling, lying prostrate, or bowing, as depicted here. And it relates that out of a deep reverence for books, Dominic used to bow before them and kiss them. Quote, when he was reading like this on his own, he used to venerate the book and bow to it and sometimes kiss it, particularly if it was a book of the gospels or if he was reading the words which Christ had spoken with his own lips. This devotional behavior was distinctly corporeal and gestural as bowing is an expression of profound humility 
as in this image. And in this case was meant to reflect and imitate Christ's own incarnation. Kissing manuscript books, a religious practice known as devotional osculation was also enshrined in the liturgy and was practiced by medieval monks, nuns and lay people. Catherine Rudy has explored how kissing manuscript books was connected to a theological understanding of scripture, an offshoot of the sensory and tactile social life, lives of books. In her words, believers also kiss the divine words whose physical presence embodied divinity, which patrons could capture through touch. The narrative evocatively describes how through Dominic's gestures, he was treating books as if they were living beings, human beings, even outside of the context of the infamous book wonder. Other details in Dominic's Vita assert the corporeal significance of books, but as a type of spiritual refreshment to be consumed with zeal. The Libellus states, his eagerness to, to imbibe the streams of Holy Scripture was so intense and so unremitting that he spent whole nights almost without sleep. So untiring was his desire to study. He set a standard that was embraced by later Dominicans, including St. Thomas Aquinas, who stated, quoting Jerome, let a book never be absent from your eye and hand. On one occasion, Aquinas quipped that he would rather possess a copy of Chrysostom on Matthew than own the whole of Paris. This single-minded enthusiasm for books had an unexpected posthumous counterpart. One inch square fragments of handwritten autographs of the prolific angelic doctor Aquinas were believed to be apotropaic when worn or carried on one's person as they were thought to be charged with the saint's sacred presence. Dozens of these scraps survive and their texts have been painstakingly reconstructed and edited. This manuscript now in the Vatican Library was copied by Aquinas and conveys the notorious illegibility of his distinctive book hand known as the indecipherable script. Um, there are only a few people alive today who can actually read it that might have also been true in Aquinas' own lifetime as well. Um, manuscripts in Aquinas' hand, including this one, were plundered and torn apart for their scraps of parchment, much like the way that the bodies of the saints would be dismembered. This is yet another way that books and miraculous textuality came to be intimately associated with the order. In the Basilica of San Domenico in Bologna, a relic of Aquinas's finger was meaningfully paired with one such strip of parchment and remains in the museum there, a fitting tribute to the hand that writes. There are other uh, fingers, finger relics of Aquinas as well in other collections. Dominic's book miracle gave rise to numerous works of art and the bulk of these has been meticulously analyzed by the German historian Thomas Werner in his landmark book on book burnings in the Middle Ages, published in 2009. The scene was first sculpted around 1264 as one of six carved panels on Dominic's marble sarcophagus, the Arca di San Domenico, by Nicola Pisano and his workshop in the Basilica of San Domenico in Bologna, Italy. This large tomb is an impressive monument, two meters high, decorated with narrative reliefs around the sides to illustrate noteworthy incidents from Dominic's life. Right, you can see the Virgin front and center here, and Dominic resurrects the young Napoleon Orsini um, from a horse who's fallen from a horse. And the book miracle is just to the right here. You can see the flames and the book hovering up above and he's clutching another book under his arms. Um, you'll notice though that the book miracle is, is really front and center, um, a place where viewers could admire it in proximity to Dominic's body, now a sacred relic. The three-dimensional sculpted version of the miracle was strategically situated to strengthen and promote his cult giving the narrative an enhanced authoritative prestige 
in the public setting. The miracle was also represented in more personal and private contexts and sometimes was made for a specifically Dominican audience. This manuscript also depicts the scene and was copied in the last quarter of the 13th century in a volume of prayers for saints vigils. Produced at a Dominican nunnery near Brussels, possibly so that the nuns themselves could venerate their patron saint, the half page miniature appears inside a historiated initial A and shows Dominic in dialogue with heretics while staring at his own manuscript, which floats above the fire in which the heretical manuscript burns. You can see his book floating and there's another book in there and up here is the hand of God, uh, which reaches down from a nebulae above pointing directly at Dominic's book, making plain its divinely sanctioned supremacy and echoing the hand gestures of the saint and his hooded interlocutors. Gesturing hands were frequently used by artists to denote disputation and debate, practices of which the early Dominicans were at the forefront. Scholastic disputation played an important role in training young mendicants and preparing them to debate with heretics. The illustration in this manuscript depicts Dominic engaged in this type of vigorous intellectual battle with the hovering book clearly demarcating his victory. Other illuminators and artists in the 14th and 15th century took up the subject and seals also employed imagery of the scene as in this example from the Dominican friary at Norwich, which is the subject of a forthcoming essay by Sandy Heslop. As a narrative about the ability of books to wield divine power it is particularly appropriate that the image was fashioned as a seal to authenticate and validate documents in the name of corporate bodies of the order. Even if one applies the incisive question posed by Stephen Justice in his essay, Did the Middle Ages Believe in Their Miracles? The abundant visual evidence of this nature reveals it was highly esteemed inside the order. As a kind of mise en abime, the seal's imagery reifies the social force of writing and books and shows how the miracle played an instrumental role in Dominican self-representation, almost giving it the status of a foundational narrative, right? We see the same gesturing hands and the wonderful pointed wizard hat. Um, as the seal shows, Dominic's book miracle made for potent religious theater and monumental works of art exploited this potential long after the event was said to have taken place. It was painted in a triptych in Pisa by Francesco Traini in 1345 and was memorialized in several other works of art, especially in panel paintings. There are several surviving examples by artists including Pedro Nicolau, Domenico Gerlandaio, and Piero di Cosimo. The eminent friar artist Fra Angelico painted the scene twice, as did the Spanish painter Pedro Barraghete, whose works were noticeably influenced by Flemish and Italian painting. This panel painting depicting St. Dominic and the Albigensians, or Cathars, um, is perhaps the finest visual expression of the legend. It captures the precise moment of Dominic's triumph over the Cathars. While the haloed saint stares impassively into the flames, his open book clasps unlocked, cover and gilt edges burnish brightly with gold, levitates midair, a juridical sign of God's judgment and a vivid illustration of the idea conveyed in the Psalms that God is wondrous in his saints. The gently tilted heads, pointing hand gestures, and rapt facial expressions of onlookers in the crowd express their astonishment that the book has just flown through the air as if moved by the invisible hand of God and now hovers above apparently of its own volition. The painting accentuates the artist's talent for complex dramatic pictorial narration. The expressiveness of the human faces and hand gestures conveys a wide range of emotional responses to the miracle, including delight, worry, curiosity, puzzlement, and hopefulness. 
this vibrant panorama of faces is matched by the variety of hats and caps worn by the figures, all of whom are male, offset by the artist's worn palette in which gold, burgundy red, and olive green dominate. The whole scene is framed in an ecclesiastical architectural interior that is decorated with a hanging tapestry embellished with the elegant golden brocade that is a hallmark of the painter's works and also decorates some of the sumptuous garments worn by the crowd. You can see that there. Two figures huddled together at right, sorry, I lost my cursor right there, <clears throat> appear to be absorbed in disputation with one nervous figure even counting on his hands, a clear indication of the practice. This character right here. The written account of this miracle in the Libellus can be used to elucidate certain details in the painting. The textual description of the codex as leaping far from the fire gives the book agency, limbs even, for one needs legs to leap. Jordan of Saxony's Latin text twice uses the verb exilio, to spring, bound, or leap out. The language implies that the book possesses not only dynamic physical movement, but also emotions and sensations, for it behaves like humans or animals who instinctively flee from fire, which suggests a sensitivity to the heat and feel of the flames. In the painting, Dominic's golden and violet book floats exultantly, while the Cather one is choked by flames, the clear loser in the battle of the books. Other human figures stare at the burning book below, open to expose the Codex's damaged insides, a reflection of the crime of heresy, the black and charred marks matching the interior malformity of doctrinal error, a negative model of revelation. Just as miracles made the saints interior or spiritual characters outwardly apparent, the artist highlights the polluting quality of the heretical book through its physical appearance. In a detail that is especially significant, the burning Cathar manuscript has a bloody wound, which you can see right there. <clears throat> um, the burning Cathar manuscript has a bloody wound, evoking the analogy between parchment and skin, book and body, found in so many medieval writings. The bleeding book in the painting draws upon this network of imagery, and it also replicates the discourses about the humanation of books attached to Dominic's legend. Too large to be an ember and more than just a tear in the parchment, the scarlet lozenge-shaped lesion reveals that the heretical book is wounded and bleeding. It too has indwelling personality, albeit a disfigured damaged one. In the foreground of the painting, the man at left here forcefully holds the Cathar manuscript in place with a metal fire iron, implying that this book also has the ability or desire to jump from the flames and needs to be pinned down, while the figure at right wields another book overhead, putting his whole body into the act of destruction, another stacked pile of books by his feet at the ready making plain that an aggressive marathon of book burning is underway. The destruction of an apparently well-stocked Cathar library. The persecuting flames, tinged with colors of gold and ox blood, parallel in miniature the brutal conflagrations that exterminated Cathar bodies by the thousands as they were typically burned alive. Werner notes that the two figures in the foreground in belted tunics and tights contain no clear markers as to which party they belong and comprise almost a second scene within the painting. He sees a cause and effect dynamic at play. Dominic's book wonder above leads to the destruction of heretical books pictured below. Crucial to his interpretation is the saint's bodily comportment. His arms are crossed with his hands pointing to the manuscript in the flames at the center of the action gestures that coolly signal condemnation as if he were giving his chilly imprimatur to the book burning. 
an endorsement that the spectator is also prompted to accept. The small pile of books by his feet seem to stand ready to meet any further challenge to his divinely sanctioned authority. The painting vividly asserts the power of Christian dogma, but it also moves beyond inquisitorial tropes in an un unexpected way. For Orthodox Christians, holiness was instantiated in matter, present and manifest in shrines, relics, the Eucharist, holy objects, the natural world, and especially in miracles, a broader subject bril brilliantly explored in Carolyn Walker Bynum's recent book, Christian Materiality. Although Cathar belief and practices varied from region to region and at different times, their dualism rejected the material world and challenged the doctrinal underpinnings of Christian materiality, especially the doctrine of the in incarnation. For them, the institutional church and its rituals, relics, and sacraments were wholly empty of meaning. The version of Dominic's book miracle enshrined in the libellus is a forceful refutation of this dualism. It's a miracle of material transformation that reifies the power of matter as the book forcefully assumes a hermeneutics of embodiment. Yet the artist goes one step further here. Both Dominic's book and the Cathar one undergo humination, but only the Cathar one bleeds as a sign of injury in the contest. This unsettling painting brings to the surface some of the assumptions that underlie medieval book miracles, which were consistently popular across the long expanse of the Middle Ages, all across Europe from Ireland to Byzantium, present in hagiography, exempla, pastoral compendia, poetry, chronicles, and in works of art. Several critics, including Werner, have noted that this painting, created over 200 years after the event was said to have taken place, endorses the violent inquisitorial practices of his own day under the first Grand Inquisitor of Spain, Torquemada, confessor to Queen Isabella I of Castile, and one of the painter's principal patrons. The painting was commissioned for the Dominican monastery of Santo Tomas in Avila, where Torquemada lived until his death. Hence, it adorned a key meeting place of the Inquisition. The painting's endorsement of Libricide had a contemporaneous historical counterpart in 1490 on the Plaza de San Esteban in Salamanca, Torquemada consigned 6,000 Jewish books to the flames, which were burned en masse. This symbolism can be seen even more starkly in other book burnings during the period in which books were set ablaze on wooden scaffolding at a site of execution, again, as if they were living beings. The penal practices of the Inquisition are made explicit in perhaps the most well-known painting by the artist, St. Dominic presiding over an auto da fe, which was created for the same patron and monastery around the same time and depicts an act of faith ceremony that entailed the torture and execution of heretics. Right, he's being, he's the ones being executed right there. <clears throat> Warner observes that this painting overtly legitimized the violence of the Inquisition and was probably painted from his own experience as auto da fe had been taking place precisely during the period of the painting's creation. The artist worked for patrons who had participated directly in the taking of Granada, the expulsion of the Jews and the Inquisition. So it's not surprising that his art expresses a triumphant Catholicism this persecuting vision is also one of embodiment. This painting unambiguously celebrates the power of embodied matter and even extended this miraculous materiality to a heretical manuscript. This depiction of Dominic's book miracle demonstrates how these narratives could be given new social meanings in new contexts. These stories typically had an overtly propagandistic component and were used by literate elites to assert orthodoxy, clerical privilege, or to establish sanctity and authority. Two earlier examples of books undergoing trial by fire exhibit this pattern. The Irish Life of St. Manu 
records how at a synod in 631, the saint had proposed a trial by fire for two codices that held different calculations of Easter. Unsurprisingly, the one favored by the saint won. In 1077 in Leon, Spain, the liturgy of the Mozarabic rite was tested against the Roman in order to determine which practice should be followed. After both books were cast into the flames and the Mozarabic one reportedly sprang out, King Alfonso VI of Castile aggressively kicked it back into the fire, a gesture that parallels the figure in the painting who pins down the Cathar manuscript with a metal fire iron. We can see how these book miracles were all used to carve out the boundaries of orthodoxy, the razor's edge beyond which non-conforming liturgical observance or heresy lies. In many of these monastically authored accounts, liturgy plays a starring role, which is fitting given the med medieval codex's vital enduring function as transmitter of the liturgical rites of the church. Klaus Schreiner notes that for this reason, the Psalter, which contains the Psalms, in particular is often figured as a miraculous book. Magical powers were sometimes attributed to books involved in the mysteries of the mass, especially in the earlier Middle Ages. Psalters were particularly important after the 13th century, especially because of the way they mediated between clerical and monastic practices and the laity becoming a particularly important category of private prayer book for religious and elite lay nobility. Yet one of the most prominent but less acknowledged characteristics of book miracles is that they rely upon corporeal manuscript metaphors, such as parchment as skin and ink as blood, precisely the tropes in this painting. These discourses fashion invented, even violent intersections between books and bodies and in particular demonstrate how manuscripts were often believed to be living, that is composed of flesh and blood and endowed with human qualities. Some manuscripts were even sometimes thought to possess inner emotions, as for instance, in an Irish miracle in the life of St. Columba, books throw themselves off a shelf to express grief at the death of their scribe and maker. The text states, and by the falling and the great noise caused thereby, they are lamenting and announcing his death. These books possess a supernatural agency and power that parallels Dominic's books, Leap from the Flames. Whether stirred by an intellectual antipathy for Cathar doctrine or moved by divine hands. Just as statues, icons, and relics reportedly bled in many of the visual and literary sources discussed by Carolyn Bynum, so too did manuscripts. For example, in the 15th century, a doubting priest near Hills Abbey in Gloucestershire opens his missal, but the text of the mass is obscured by bloody scripts. The text said, says, and found he with blood his letters all bespunged. And while several book miracles such as Dominic's are well known, they merit more attention for what they can tell us about how some medieval people perceived the potential of the codex to transform materially and become human. <clears throat> Throughout the Middle Ages, the somatic nature of miraculous books was often connected to beliefs about relics. Books often behaved like relics or venerated as relics, hallowed by the saint's sacred touch or even sanctified by the mere presence of his or her writings, as in the case of Aquinas mentioned earlier. The saints, those exemplars of death in life, were strongly believed to inhabit their shrines through their relics, those bones, body parts, and effluvia, as well as clothing and other objects that came into contact with them, known as contact relics. Just as saints were believed to be physically present in their relics and at their shrines, so too could they, genie-like, materially inhabit a manuscript book. The gem-studded book covers of medieval manuscripts sometimes house relics within them, making the saint's presence even more literal. Following the logic of Christian belief, in such cases it's difficult to tell where the codex ends and the body of the saint begins. They not only overlapped, but were believed to fuse. Saints were also, oh, sorry, 
buried with books, as for instance, uh, the early 8th century St. Cuthbert or Stonyhurst Gospel, now in the British Library, shown here, the earliest European book with an original intact binding. This manuscript was so closely identified with the saint that it was at some point buried with his body. In Binding Words, Textual Amulets in the Middle Ages, Don Schemer discusses how in its afterlife, various people wore this manuscript on their bodies. Attached by a silk cord to the binding, the codex was hung around the necks of various bishops and other distinguished visitors to Durham. In his words, quote, the boundaries between textual amulets, sacred books, and holy relics could be quite fluid, and at times the three could be one and the same thing. Many manuscripts, especially insular ones, were enshrined in a metal case or cumdoc, a book shrine, as in this example, which served as a reliquary covering for the vibrant bookish matter of the stone missal housed within, a format that accentuates the idea that books were frequently apprehended as relics. Cynthia Hahn observes that medieval reliquaries were often fashioned to appear to speak and in general display a marked lively, liveliness. We can see that at work here in the inscriptions that cover this book shrine. This vivacity likewise is everywhere in medieval book miracles. Whether burned as the symbolic limbs of the heretic's body or tested in fire and water, medieval books were perceived as active, energetic, on the move, fecund, full of agency. Oaths were sworn on books, they were carried into battle, used to exercise demons and for healing purposes, held aloft in processions, and carried around fields to ensure a successful harvest. They could be read, rubbed, gazed upon, worn on the body, kissed and embraced, as the research of Don Schemer and Catherine Rudy has carefully documented. Anathemas or book Book curses written into manuscripts by scribes and owners also gave books a voice as they muttered dark curses, calling down thunder on would-be thieves or others who would intentionally steal, deface, or damage books in some way. And in the eyes of some medieval people, miraculous books leaped, wept, and even bled, defying the laws of nature and undergoing humanation. Medieval books written on vellum or parchment already embodied radical transformations of matter, from animal flesh to painted pages of beauty and wonder, from dead skins to repositories for the sacred and divine. Manuscripts were notoriously sturdy and durable, like this one, but also subject to change, erasure, and alteration, including the whims and interventions of scribes, artists, and owners. Manuscripts bore the distinct imprint of both their human makers and their users. Parchment, ink, pigment, burnished gold, and bejeweled covers consistently gestured to something luminous and ineffable, yet unmistakably corporeal. Just how far we have come from this notion of the book really remains to be seen. Thank you very much. Stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if you have a question or a comment, you can just drop your name in the chat or write your name and I'll or unmute yourself. Any questions? Oh, there's a question from uh, Virginia. Hi, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I am really, really interested in this work that you're doing and, and find what you've had to say very, very persuasive. Um, I, I was wondering, and just this is simply an offering if you don't know it, do you, do you know the life of Desiderius of Long, the martyr of Long, who imitates um, Saint-Denis and picks up his own head and walks back into the city of Long? Um, he has a, a miracle story of a book. He's holding the gospel book, and it's pierced by the vandals. Have you heard this one? 
people don't know it, and I, I, I'm dying to read it. <laughs> yeah. No, and unfortunately, I, I haven't been able to find any images of it. Um, I'm working on a, um, a, a book of medievalism here that's in Kansas City in the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, and it happens to be made in 1902, like a book of hours. And that's how I got on to um, uh, St. Didier, as they call him, um, at his martyrdom. And this is actually in a French play that's 500 pages long. The French play is enormous. Um, the, the, as they decapitate him, the sword goes through the Gospels he's holding, and his blood goes all over the Gospels, and yet none of the text is eradicated. Um, so I, I thought that might be something to be useful for your research. If you're, if you're interested, I could send you, send you the link. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, there's also another, um, I'm forgetting it right now, but there's another saint where something similar is true, um, where when he's, he's holding a book and the book becomes covered in his blood and then that becomes a relic. Um, I want to say it's a Dominican saint as well, but I'm, I'm forgetting which one it is. Um, but thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. I, I really love the idea of how the, the, the body and the relic are, are fused and, and that works very well for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question from Jonathan Schwartz. Yes, hi. Hi, Marlene. How are you? Thank you. Um, I'm a former student of Marlene's. So uh, um, I just wanted to ask you at the very beginning of the talk, um, you mentioned that book miracles were considered events against nature, yet it seemed like um, much of the rescuing of the books were performed by nature, as in animals saving books from water and um, other such miracles. And I was wondering how that dichotomy works exactly. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Uh, it's, it's true, and, you know, uh, animals are helpers in, in a lot of those instances. Um, well, I think it's the, the idea is that a miracle is something that, ha not necessarily a book miracle, but miracles in general are things that happen that are against nature, that defy the laws of, of logic and nature, if that makes sense. So if it like, in other words, the book, um, although the animals is true, right? Um, as you mentioned, like they're helpers in some way, the fact that the book is perfectly preserved, that's what's really against nature, right? If that makes sense. Um, I wanna say in the early middle ages, saints lives, um, you often see nature taking on a, a, a larger role, especially like in the Irish lives of the saints, et cetera, animals or big otters and cows, et cetera, are all over the place. Thank you. Thank you. Question from uh, Dan. Uh, uh, are there views of these phenomena that were not considered heretical? Um, skeptical views of, um, of the book miracles in particular, or of, I'm not sure if that's what you mean. Um, okay. Yes, were there contemporaneous skeptics regarding the, mir the miracles? Uh, yes. Who started as anti, who aren't heretical or considered heretical by being skeptical. Right. No, you could be skeptical of miracles or of relics um, from an orthodox standpoint from within the church. So, um, you know, it, it, there was a kind of, um, there were discourses of reform and criticism within the medieval church itself that doubted many, you know, s certain miracles. Um, I don't know if there's... Um, I haven't found any uh, evidence of Dominic's book miracle specifically being doubted. Um, so that's a that's a, a good question. On the other hand, there are two different versions of Dominic's book miracle, and the one that became the most popular, the one that I talked about, um, is actually slightly later. There's an earlier version where they're not two different books battling each other, but they're like, um, like a, what's called a kedula, which is a, a sheet of parchment listing all the authoritative ideas of each. 
um, of both Orthodox Christianity and Cathars. So um, does that answer your question? I'm not sure, Dan, if I'm answering it or not. It does, it does. You know, you wouldn't have been facing being burned by at the time saying, I don't know about this particular account. No, I don't think so. No, I mean, you're more likely to be burned for being a Cathar, right? Or did okay. not do transubstantiation or, you know, something like that than you would be for not believing in a miracle. And okay. usually when people report miracles, they go out of their way to authorize it in some way saying, I heard this, I saw this, someone I know saw it, right? Okay, no, that answers my question, that's interesting. Okay. Question from uh, Mark, did you wanna ask that? Yes, uh, okay. from where and when does the, pro the practice of swearing on a Bible, taking an oath on a Bible date from? That's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Um, but I want to say it would have been at least by the 8th century is what I'm thinking. There are a lot of other medievalists in the crowd. Maybe somebody else knows the answer to it. Um, but I want to say very early on, right, it became an object that one swore on. Okay. I think Bede mentions it. So definitely 8th century. Um, it's established probably far before that. Right, right, yes. I think that's right. Interesting, thanks. And, uh, I see a question Madison. here. Madison. Hello, thank you so much for this. It was super interesting. Uh, and uh, something I was wondering is, uh, from what I gathered, it seemed like you were applying a lot of these sort of almost human traits to like books as a category. And uh, something I was wondering is, are books unique in how they seem to have these like inherent characteristics as opposed to another object? And as opposed to the possibility of like an object having to have specific history in order to have to have like these sort of, uh, I guess the humanness an agency you ascribe to the books in your talk. Thank you so much. Um, I would say, you know, I, I think that um, in Christian materiality, uh, Bynum gives a lot of examples of like paintings that come alive and leap off the wall or, you know, icons that turn to flesh and blood. Um, I think books have more in common with images in that sense, right? Image like all of a sudden a crucifix will um, turn its head or you know, do something. Um, so I would say that they share, I think they share that, their um, ability to become human um, with, um, with objects and other, other material um, objects. On the other hand, I do think that um, some of the parallels might have to do with the, um, the nature of the manuscript book as an animal in some way, you know, that it's, we still like talk about like the spine of the book and the, um, a lot of the ways we think about books are a reflection of our own bodies. Um, you know, there's many more that I'm not, I'm not thinking of right now, but I think the spine of the book is always the one that I think of that, you know, that books are uh, an interesting extension of, or a reflection, a mirror image in some way of the body. Okay. Uh, Martha, Martha Driver, has a question. I'm almost afraid to unmute, hang on. Um, I just wanted to ask Marlene, that was a wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, the Comdaki is Irish. Are these indigenous to Ireland or do you see the books writing elsewhere? Um, I, well, there's the, um, what's the, the, there's a famous one at the Morgan Library. Um, it's, I mean, there's, I guess 
if you think of treasure bindings. Oh, okay. So you're also including treasure bindings in the kind of book shrine category. I think so. If they, oh. have, if they have a relic in on the cover in some way, um, then it's very similar. Um, in Ireland and in Scotland, the there are more cumdoc that survive from from um, from over there. Um, I think partly because they used to have hereditary keepers who would be in the doers that would be in charge of the relics. And so they often um, kept them and preserved them over time. Whereas I think a lot of other stuff, just like the jewels, jeweled covers would get ripped off the manuscripts. Um, the keepers are like the keepers of the Holy Grail. Um, I'm just teaching Robert de Boron right now, um, but also gems on, on covers, on book covers, probably have some kind of miraculous or even magical um, um, qualities that might be used to preserve or make the book somehow more holy or sacred, I would say. Mm -hmm. Right, absolutely. Right, they reflect you know, the heavenly Jerusalem or some, something like that too. Ah, I see Catherine's also responding in the chat that the Kumdok cannot be opened. That's interesting. Other types of shrines or bindings. Right. That's interesting. So does that mean that the book is not meant to be read in the Kumdok, Catherine? Yeah. Uh, hi, Marlene, that was a wonderful talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, my understanding is that um, the kumdak um, is different from other forms of binding in that there's not, you know, a clasp or some other way in which it can be opened. And it's expected that once the book goes into the kumdak, um, you know, it's not meant to be taken out in the, you know, sort of the, the with the frequency or under the circumstances that other books would be taken out and that it is very much a kind of Irish, Scottish phenomenon. Um, that, that's my understanding of the, the Kumdak. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. I, I, I wasn't aware that, that um, once it goes in, it doesn't come out again. You know? that, yeah, at least in theory, yeah. Interesting. Question from Seth Lara. Yes, thank you. And thanks for that wonderful talk and the great conversation. Um, I'm interested, or a long time ago, I was interested in Old English books and in riddles of the book and the way in which the Anglo-Saxon riddle tradition imbues books with a kind of magical, you know, ratlich kind of worked, worked quality. And listening to the conversation about Irish and Scottish books, my real question is this, is there um, is there a kind of insular fascination with the book and the miracle that distinguishes it from continental or Mediterranean attitudes? In other words, we're talking about this as if this is a sort of pan-medieval phenomenon. But right. I'm wondering if, if this is something that in origin or in the history is something that really is coming out of a uh, an Irish English insular fascination with the sacrality of the book and the sacrality of the letter uh, itself. And if that's something that then eventually um, gets back into continental Europe or becomes part of the narrative of holiness and saints life, if you see, if you see, sort of see what I'm trying to get at. I do, I do. And um, I, you know, I think I have been trying to argue that it's sort of pan-European because Although um, like some of the richest evidence I think is actually the Irish. Um, you know, they have um, connected with the life of St. Columba um, in particular, but lots of Irish saints seem to have um, book, different kinds of book miracles attached to them. Um, so there is, you know, there is this, um, this possibility that, um, you know, that's where they, they start out right in that setting and then they kind of get diffused. Um, but the part that I think is, is uh, so 
curious is that there's they're just all over the place you know i mean and they continue to be popular and a lot of the evidence i showed you was 15th century so it goes all the way to the end of um the end of the uh, the, mid the middle ages um just kind of on that note i think and i i definitely think you're right that the in old english literature and the insular context book there's more kind of quasi magical overtones to do with books and reading um but i think that it's it's like a discourse about books that is connected with other discourses about books about like you know blood is ink or parchment is skin um metaphors that catherine smith has also written so wonderfully about um and I think that these discourses like sort of start out in monastic settings in general, and then they get diffused from there. And then you get them in, you know, but once they get preached or get into sermons, then lay people take them up. And then you start to see um, secular artists embracing them more. So I would say, you know, I would say definitely monastic, you know, they start out in early monasticism and then I hope that makes sense. But. see uh, two more questions. I'm not sure oh. I understand the one about the, um, the, the Torah, which... That's mine. Um, I guess what I'm hearing is a lot of what you talked about seems like things like just as the Israelite faith, as it moved into different territories, adopted habits, rituals, thoughts of the neighboring tribes and tried to incorporate them in part to incorporate the people into the Israelite faith. Well, it seems that every faith borrows from what comes before. And so a lot of the worship of a book is very parallel to the worship of the Torah. Uh, the physical Torah is dressed uh, like a high priest in, um, would have been in the Jerusalem temple. and. Um, it was including a breastplate that's hung around, uh, was hung around the neck with jewels on it, which looked very much like the jewel encrusted book covers you were showing. And uh, it, it seems that it's just, it, it's partially an incorporation or a echoing of things that make sense. Well, you treat the book as holy, you know, just as when the Torah is marched around a synagogue during services and people reach out to touch it or kiss it you know there's a lot of the same sort of worship there uh, and uh, there's some parallel and obviously talking about animal skins well that's the nature of the torah is it is an animal skin but I, i'm probably saying things that are obvious to most people who are here well no that's very that's very they're very useful thank you for that yeah i often often think very narrowly about the Middle Ages and the Christian Middle Ages and, and often forget about that aspect. So thank you. I also wanted to say that uh, I also went to Binghamton, but that's the, I've had other discussions on that. Thank you. It was a very good lecture, very interesting. Thank you. Um, I see one more question from Liam Branley another one of my former students. Um, are you there? Do you want to put it into an early medieval Ireland, certain holy objects were enshrined as relics in their own right? Books, but also handbells. The word survives, meaning defense protection, a veil covering. Cover. Great. Thank you. So, um, not a question, more of a, a comment, but... <laughs> Yes, wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for the invitation. Oh, thank you. I'm glad that all the, 
uh, I see my medieval friends that are here will now learn, know about the comics and picture story symposium, um, which is great. So you're really, it's a remarkable institution. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Next week is um, Will Eisner week. Every year there's one um, lecture devoted to the cartoonist Will Eisner. So that's happening next week. Uh, thank you. It was really interesting. Great. Take care. Everybody. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much.